In the previous episode of Beyond the Dark, we talked about the stranger's revenge on the small town that vilified him. As the evening continues, someone approaches the stranger, and most likely a little drunk, dares to mock him to his face. Calling him a godless heathen who cannot satisfy his wife, the rawest laughter quickly comes to an end as he finally has enough of the town's poisonous perception of him and unleashes a violence of a man akin to such ways. After making a pact, he returned to something utterly evil and began his rampage upon the townsfolk, feasting and gorging itself on their remains. For in these dark hours, the creature steps forth from its lair and eviscerates any who dare tread into its hunting ground. In this final episode, we shall see the downfall of the vampire. With the light of first dawn shining into their bleary eyes, their bones cold and bodies weary from sleepless nights, the survivors are greeted with the hideous sight of the creature's hunt. The thoroughfare is now swamped in blood with the pungent smell overpowering their senses and many of the homes laid bare with its previous occupants gutted on the streets. Without a moment to spare, many gather what little provisions they have left, for the mornings are now a festival of fear. With either horse and cart or on foot, many attempt to flee, their destinations unknown, for the pandemonium has reduced the village to a shivering wreck. But a few remain behind, refusing to give up their lives to some hideous beast. With nowhere else to turn, the local chaplain demands that the Lord should form a hunting party to kill the foul creature. But instead of getting a shocked reaction and the support he expects, the Lord looks at him with utter annoyance, claiming he has no time for peasant superstitions. The two men argue over the next few hours with neither making any ground until the priest is forced to leave and face this evil alone. After a week of more bloodshed, the chaplain calls for a meeting on Palm Sunday in the parish church where he plans to rid the village of the abomination. He knows the only person who could have returned as this monstrosity was a stranger, and after assembling a group of devout followers and prominent citizens, his plan of attack laid bare, he makes it known he will not see the remainder of his flock dragged down into the pits of hell. With righteous fury, he will cast the creature back to the depths and salt whatever earth it walked upon. But what the priest doesn't know is that he will never get a chance to initiate his plan, for two brave young men blinded by revenge are already at the grave, the two brothers who lost their father to the plague. With shovel and pickaxe, their bodies covered in mud and perspiration, the two brothers work tirelessly to uncover the hideous truth buried deep within the soil. When the ground gives way and the air becomes fetid with a coppery scent of blood and rot, they find themselves staring into the abyss. For they find no coffin buried beneath the dirt, but instead a hole leading into a long forgotten crypt. Climbing down into the pit, they soon discover the remains of the stranger's coffin at the bottom. It has been splintered into pieces and claw marks cover the surface. Clearly, when he returned as the ghoulish spectre, the thrashing and clawing of his body caused the collapse. Covering their faces from the stench, one of them ignites a torch to bring light to this layer of unbroken blue. It is clear that for centuries it has been long abandoned, but now its new occupant has called it home, for in the light the hideous truth is laid bare for all to see. 
they now know where all the villagers had gone. Lining the walls like grotesque decorations of a mad king, their bodies in different stages of decay, contorted and strung up, the chewed entrails leading further into the crypt, and the ones that still have faces clearly show they died screaming. The two brothers know somewhere deep within, the body of their father lays forgotten and tossed aside like a misused toy in this labyrinth of gore. As they traverse the near endless corridors, the torches light glistening off the moist remains of the recently buried, the fat maggots dropping from the ceiling, their hunger sated, the two brothers finally enter the main chamber of horrors and uncover the depths of the creature's greed. With its lust for blood and endless gorging, it has caused it to become so bloated and fat that it is unable to move, its stomach protruding from its body like a toad, far too heavy for its cadaverous frame. Sitting upon its throne of gore, its features puffy and covered in claret, it glares at the two men with utter hatred. Brandishing the spade like a holy lance, one of the brothers steps forth and attempts to slay the beast, but with slashing talons and a hideous screech, the creature fends off its attacker. One of the young men, seeing no other option, throws the torch at the beast, causing it to shy away from the flame. Knowing this is their only chance, they get behind the creature and with great effort pin it to the floor, the weight of its bloated stomach trapping it to the core stone. With a sharp thrust downwards, the spade bites into its neck, and with a twist of the blade, its vertebrae is split, and with immense effort, its head is slowly torn from its body, the sinew and muscle stretching like black vine. The brothers gag as they witness the head tear off, and the once bloated body spew forth all the blood and meat it had gorged upon, and like a deflated flesh balloon, it returns to its cadaverous frame. Seizing it by the legs, they return to the entrance and to their surprise, they see the priest and his followers staring back down at them. After climbing out of the hole and hoisting the body above ground, the priest begins to shout at the young men for being careless with their lives, but he is also full of an unnameable fear. For the creature isn't dead. He explains how to really kill it, they must remove its blackened heart, otherwise by the next night, it will return and its revenge will be biblical. Seizing the shovel, the priest kicks the corpse onto its back, and with righteous fury he promised the creature, he pierces the blade into its sternum, and with a twist and a solid kick, he tears open its ribcage and exposes the still-beating organ. Grabbing it with both hands, he tears the heart out of the chest cavity and presents it to the brothers to be burned. Now tightly bound, the body is dragged through the village like a grotesque trophy and eventually thrown onto the pyre. Once lit, the blaze can be seen for miles, the cleansing light pushing back the darkness that once held strong over this small village. As the smoke rises and the embers fall, the putrid and fetid air starts to become clear once more as the plague rescinds. The spirits of those lost were avenged by man's greatest discovery. And as the fire burns, the Alnwick Vampire is no more.